Hello everyone, Rob Berthoff here, excited to talk about last day events. That's kind of the, the theme of this little video. And, you know, I think there's a lot of, obviously, focus on what's happening in the news right now. Um, you know, things have been escalating. You know, if we listen to news, we think that, you know, World War III has just started. Um, we can get very scared about this. Um, you know, there's talk of nuclear war. We know how fast that can get out of control. You know, there's a, you know, it's certainly a good time to, to fill the church and pray for God to save us from uh, you know, immediate death, but it's not in the way that we may think. It doesn't feed into this repent or burn mentality because that doesn't actually get us anywhere, right? So what I want to make sure we're thinking of is, is not this uh, scaredness to come to God, but a desire to come to God. We should be thinking about, you know, does God want uh, people to serve him out of fear or out of love. And we read in the Bible that it's very clear that if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. And so, you know, when we start thinking about uh, everything that's happening, you know, what's the correlation? Like, how do we make sense of this? How do we understand the difference between, you know, works and faith? How do we understand the difference between fear and love? Um, ultimately, you know, how do we process everything, right? Just in the last year alone, we've seen extreme weather changes. We've seen massive flooding. We've seen, you know, just in the last year, there was tons of different major volcanic eruptions, Iceland, Philippines, Italy, et cetera. And some of those happened in the same, in the same uh, period of week, right? If we remember before, you know, uh, all the craziest with the pandemic, and even during that, we had really intense wildfires, right? We went from one wildfire straight into some, you know, into the next. And these happened all over the world, right? Um, we just went through a global pandemic, you know? I mean, it, it feels like, yes, there's um, restrictions are loosening, but but what did we learn from this, right? Was God in this? Was God teaching us a lesson? Was God trying to uh, show us something? What's all this about? You know, and there's becomes this talk of, you know, it's the end, like this is the end. And, you know, this you know, fear mongering or this ultimately just pushing fear. And kind of reminds me of the story in 1 Kings 19, how Elijah, um, saw God pass, or not saw, but um, experienced God passing before him. And we read that there was a great wind, right? But it says that God was not in the wind. And then there was a great earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a big fire, but God was not in the fire, right? We read that after the fire was a sm still small voice, and that's how God speaks in very subtle ways. And so this is a lesson for us. This is everything the Bible is, is created for instruction and reproof. And this instructs us how to actually hear God speaking, right? So the lesson is that God speaks in a very gentle voice. And, you know, God is whispering to us. And, and, and when we are in tune with him and, and reading his and studying and praying, we hear him. And he just says, come home. You know, he says, you know, everything's in, under control. Don't fear. That's what God says right now. God is telling us that we shouldn't fear. Okay. But how can we hear God's still small voice if the radio or the TV is nonstop, right? If we're so busy with the world or if we're spiritually or, metaf you know, or physically um, sleeping all the time, right? If we're, phys if we're uh, spiritually asleep, how can God actually speak to us? And so I believe that while, you know, God was not in the fire, God was not in the, the, the earthquake, right? God showed those as a way to, to get our attention. And sometimes God needs to do things to get our attention, right? Maybe it's failing at something. Maybe it's uh, money issues. Maybe it's a car crash, right? Like what does it take for God to wake us up? And, you know, what I've personally experienced and know for a fact for, in my life is when I'm connected with God, everything is really chill. Like, you know, obviously, like, I need to connect with God even further than I am. But I'll tell you right now, God is really good. And God uses these times when we are connected with him to show us his blessings. And I know that times that I, you know, completely step away or times that I um, start looking to self— you know, I'll get 
I'll get reminders and I just pray, God, like, you know, remind me in the most gentle way you can, in the most subtle way you can. I want to hear you. I want to listen. But if we're not listening to God, he will send things to wake us up or I believe actually ultimately, um, you know, remove his um, presence from it, not presence, but, but you know, eyesight on us so that we will have an opportunity ultimately to wake up. So do we learn from that? And do we maybe listen when the little things are happening? You know, a splinter in our finger, you know, versus um, waiting for, you know, us to wreck a car or waiting for the pandemic or for us to get sick, right? Waiting for wars, right? What does it take for us to hear God's voice? How loud does he have to speak? I remember, you know, uh, growing up, you know, my mom would just be like, come in and she would sing you know, hymns or things like this very gently and quietly and we turn some music on and I'd wake up in the morning, right? Um, to the extreme of when I was in the military, they would come, you know, literally hit the, you know, your beds and, and yell and shout. Like the point is like, what does it take to wake up? And, and if we are listening, it doesn't take a lot. So we see this whole, you know, the state of the world right now, right? And while we should be concerned with the state of the world, like we need to see what's happening with wars right now, but what are we to learn from this? Is this God telling us the world is ending? Well, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the world has been ending for the last hundred plus years, but is God speaking through this conflict? I mean, no, like this is not God speaking in the sense that it is a wake up call so we can hear God's voice, right? God only speaks through the still small voice. We read in you know, Matthew 24 how um, Jesus told his disciples that there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, but not to be troubled because the wars don't signify an end of the world. A war is just, they're going to come and they're going to pass. And you know, while wars are incredibly tragic, we can't get so caught up in the war, right? where it actually pulls us away from God. I've seen examples right now where, you know, you see on TV and or, you know, on YouTube or whatever, you know, people saying, you know, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm going to go take up arms and I'm going to go fight against, you know, the Russians myself. Like God, we're literally, Lucifer is using wars to get us so angry at the enemy, right? That we'll end up breaking the commandments that God gives us that thou shalt not kill. And so we need to be really understanding what all this means and not allowing um, us to get so caught up in the hatred of us versus them. We need to be listening, you right? Keep calm and listen for God. Listen for that still small voice, right? Let's not lose sight of him. Let's not lose faith in him. He is in control. It reminds me of in Matthew 8, 23, where the disciples you know, they were traveling with Jesus on this journey and, and everything around them got super chaotic and they panicked and they looked at Jesus, but he was sleeping, right? He was resting, right? And sometimes we look and we like, like, Jesus, how can you allow the world to fall apart like this is? How can you allow all this craziness to be happening, right? And Jesus, you know, the disciples are crying out like, you know, save us. The world is ending. We're going to perish, right? And how did Jesus respond? You know, his response was, why do you fear? Have faith. Right? Then he demonstrated his power and quieted the storm, and there was perfect peace. In Jesus, no matter how chaotic the world is, there's perfect peace. But I've found that only if we're abiding in Jesus do we experience that. Otherwise, we're not under his control. Right? If we're in the world, the devil claims to have us, but we have a choice of who we choose. Do we choose God and his protection or do we allow ourselves to be thrown about in the waves of the world, in the chaos of the world? We need to make the choice to be in the boat with God under his protection. And God has allowed us to have free will, but we still need to make that decision, right? We need to say, do I trust God and believe that he is fair and his laws are just and he ultimately wants the best for me? Or do I distrust God? We need to choose who we serve, right? The way that we act, the way we interact, the way we, who we put our faith in, right? You know, ultimately will determine if we get the seal of God 
or choose our own path and be left to the destroyer? Do we trust in God and eat from the tree of life? Or trust in human reasoning, right? Trust in ourselves, you know, looking for enlightenment, looking for, um, you know, transcendence, getting so caught up in, in evil, who do we choose? Do we take the, the blue pill and trust God fully, even though, you know, if you ever watched this thing, hopefully you haven't. Uh, it was this idea that like, you know, blue is asleep. No, blue is, is trust. Right? Red pill is the idea of awakening, is an idea of needing to fight for ourselves, needing to save ourselves. Who we ultimately yield to is who we're servants of. Romans 6, 16. This means how we spend our time determines who our God is. We are told to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the Father is not in him. How many of us are listening to music, not hymns? How many of us are spending time watching TV, going to the movies, doing things of the world that are just literally stealing our time away from God? Now we rationalize, it's not so bad. It's just like just watching a movie. Like I'm just... You know, I'm tired. I have stuff I need to do. You know, I'm just enjoying what the world has to offer. But if we're not 100% focused on God, we are of the world. Again, read the last part. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. There's a choice that we have to make. Face it. Okay? How we spend our time determines who we serve. Is our day spent on activities which glorify self? Or are we spending time glorifying God? How is our time being used? Is it being used uh, ultimately, you know, rooting ourselves more into the world? Right? Or is it by looking above the world? We have to make a choice. Do we serve God or do we serve self? And while the little actions may not seem like a big deal, if you're not getting the wake-up calls, the wake-up calls are going to come stronger and stronger until ultimately you make a choice. Joshua said, Choose you this day whom you will serve. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 2 Corinthians, Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, and God will receive us. So what are we doing? How many of us are still living our lives like we don't actually believe Jesus is coming? We read about the seventh church, which is Laodicea. That's the church we're in right now, right? Revelation 3, if you've been part of the, Bible, the Revelation Bible studies, you're already fully up to speed what this means. But in this, God says, I know thy works, right? He's talking about this church, and he says, you're neither hot nor cold, but I wish you were either hot or cold. I wish you'd make up your mind. I want to come back, he says. I want to return. I want all this wars and famines and, and hurt to end. But until you make up your mind, how can I come back? Because you're just going to be lost, right? So he says, I wish you were, uh, you know, because you are hot, uh, uh, neither hot nor cold, because you're lukewarm, because you're riding the fence, because you haven't decided to make a choice, ultimately you're going to make your choice for the deceiver. You're going to make a choice for self. I will spew thee out of my mouth. You're either hot or you're cold. And lukewarm means you're cold. But there's good news, right? Like, there's still time. And, and the good news is that if we confess our sins, God wants to forgive us and heal us and put us back on the right path, put us under his protection where nothing can touch us. But we have to be on guard, right? Right? Because the condemnation is that light has come into the world. There are, God is reaching out to us. But which one of us loves darkness rather than light? Are we holding on to sins because we do not think that God is more powerful than the deceiver? Right? That we're always going to be sinning. Oh, I just can't help it. God's, you know, Satan's more powerful than God. Right? Or is it because we actually have grown such a flavor, such a, a, a taste for this world, we don't want to lose it. We think of Lot's wife. We think of how, you know, she was leaving and, and all she wanted to do was go back into the city. As the city was burning, all she wanted to do was be a part of it. Today, 
If you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Remember that God is stronger than the deceiver. James 4, 7, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. God is faithful, who will suffer you not to be tempted more than you're able. With temptation, he will make a way for you to escape. There is no temptation that God will not save us from. He will not give us a path to overcome. Any temptation that we face, God has already created a path for us to escape it. When the sinner realizes the aggregated character of sin, when he realizes how much we hurt God by, by transgressing his law and hurting others, we will stop sinning. Jesus has even said, my favorite story there is in John 8, Jesus picks up, cleans us off, sends us back out again with a clean slate and the ability to never fall again. And this is the wonderful news for us today, that there's a guaranteed path of salvation for every human on earth and it's not too late. Now, unto him that is able to keep you from falling, right? And, and, and more than this, he gives exceeding joy. The only peace we'll find on earth is through God. But more interestingly, well, that's nothing more interesting than that, but, but, but we have a role to play, right? We are a chosen generation, we are to be a peculiar people. We are to be standing out from the world. We're not to be so wrapped up into the world. So what are we waiting for? Why are we still one foot in, one foot out? Right? What are we waiting before we make a choice? The end of the world? Right? The disciples asked Jesus, what were the signs of your coming? What's the signs of the end of the world? And he says, well, the sun will be darkened, moon, stars will fall. Right? We read the same thing in Revelation. Right? In the sixth seal, we read about there was a great earthquake, the moon became blood, and the stars of heaven fell. Okay? So we have a punch list. Here's all the signs of the times. Here's everything that needs to be fulfilled before Jesus can come. Okay? So we start off here. Right? We have, you know, are we waiting for the big earthquake? Well, no. This was already fulfilled in 1755 in the big Lisbon earthquake. Okay, so what? Are we waiting for the sun to be darkened? No, this was fulfilled back in 1780. In the great dark day. So we're just waiting for the stars to fall. But that already happened again, 1833. So what? Waiting for pestilences? Guys, we just went through a global pandemic, right? Like, are we waiting for the plagues? You know, here's the thing. The plagues are not going to happen until after the close of probation, after we're sealed, right? So the same way the Israelites put blood on their doorposts and were passed over by the Egyptians, uh, sorry, by the plagues that, that fell upon the Egyptians, God's people never have to worry about the plagues. If we choose God, we're under his protection. Plagues are completely irrelevant. I don't even focus on them, right? Because they're after the close of probation. All we've got to do is get to the close of probation, and then it doesn't matter anymore. I mean, even now, it doesn't matter. God will take care of us if we're fully aligned with him. But if we at one foot in and one foot out, God will continue to bring things into our lives that wake us up until we make a choice for him or someone else. But we've got to make a choice one way or the other. So I ask again, what are we waiting for before we actually give our heart to God and say, God, I, I, I want to go all in, right? Are we waiting for some apocalypse to courses to show up, right? Is this what we're waiting for? Well, if we study Revelation, they already came, right? In fact, the four horses correspond to the first three church, four churches. That all ended in 1798, right? By the way, we're studying this tomorrow, um, if you're already in the group. Uh, anyways, the, the point is, like, okay, so the trumpets. We're waiting for the trumpets to sound, right? That's, that's when we're going to get ready. When the trumpets start sounding, we're going to get ready. But that was the sixth seal, okay? The, the second woe, which is the final warning, already happened, Right? It, it, it was the Ottoman Empire um, rule that actually moved, uh, that covered the same time period, by the way, as the dark day, as the stars falling at all, the lines are at the top of the same piece. All that concluded in 1840. So what's left? I mean, the seventh seal is Jesus returning. There's, there's literally nothing between what has already happened and Jesus' return. 
There's no, there's no prophecy remaining. There's no time prophecy. There's, there's, there's literally just Jesus waiting for us. So what are we waiting for, right? I mean, we're waiting for the Sunday law. We're waiting for, you know, a, a forced religious um, thing to happen. Well, newsflash, that already started back in 1888. But God saved us from that. And, you know, A.T. Jones was able to, um, you know, lobby, um, you know, Congress, uh, the Senate, sorry, and get that to be stopped. We read that we as a people have not accomplished the work which God committed to us. We are not ready for the issue which the enforcement of Sunday law brings to us. We're not ready, right? Like God is waiting for us and things are going to get worse and worse and more chaotic until we actually get it together. The Lord is, Ellen White writes, the Lord has shown her that the, clearly the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. But we also know that when probation cut, closes, it'll come suddenly and unexpectedly and at a time we're least expecting it. The only way that it can come when we least expect it is that it's going to come at the same, about the same time. So for that, when we read in 1 Peter that the judgment begins at the house of the Lord, then if we're waiting for the National Sunday Law to happen, it's about the same exact time as a close of probation for God's people, not for the entire close of probation. But the, the beginning of the close of probation, God will be um, sealing um, the living, starting in his church. So if we're waiting for this to happen before we get ready, it's going to be too late. We know the story of the five wise and the five foolish, right? How the five foolish did not bring any oil. Okay, so they that were foolish took their lamps, but no oil with them. What's the lesson? The oil, as we know, is the Holy Spirit. Right? So there was five that had prepared and had their oil, had the Holy Spirit, you know, connected with Jesus, had the character of Christ. And the other five were just kind of like waiting for stuff to happen. And, you know, let me go another movie. Let me go, you know. Uh, eat some more steaks and, and you know, whatever it is. I'm going to go hang out with my friends and, and I'll, 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 I'll talk to God eventually. Once it gets really serious, I'll talk to God. Is that how we want to be? Or do we want to be the five wise who proactively have taken more oil, essentially the idea of connecting with the Holy Spirit, right? So we need to be proactive, not reactive. There's been enough signs over the last several years to show that you know, we don't want to wait for something crazy to happen and then spin all over the place. When the, when the Ukraine thing really started, it just bothered me when people came to me and they're just like, oh, it's all, it's all crazy, crazy. Focus, guys. Nothing has changed. Yes, let's do what we can to help them, but nothing has changed. We need to be proactive. We need to be thinking about what comes next. We need to understand the times and know what to do. First Chronicles 12.32, slight paraphrase, but that's it. We essentially know what we need to do, right? And this is a very small version of this list, but we need to get out of the city. We need to stop being in the world, get out of the world, okay? We need to prepare a remnant economy, but the most important thing we need to do that most of us look over, right? We're ready to like, you know, learn about how we can filter our own water and, and how, you know, storing up, you know, 10 years of beans. No, like we need to prepare our hearts and our characters for Christ's return. Speaking of the cities, right, you know, for this, we're told very directly, soon there will be such strife and confusion in the cities that those who wish to leave them will not be able. What do we see in the Ukraine? Just days ago, everyone's clamoring to get on, you know, on trains to get out of town, and there's gunshots, military are firing off gunshots to calm the crowd down. Right? You know, we see how, you know, they're keeping, you know, men and drafting them in service. The point is this. We got to get out of the cities, okay? But we just got to get far enough out of the city where we can connect to God. We read that we're not to locate ourselves where we'll be forced into close relations with those that do not honor God. If our neighbor is playing, you know, heavy metal next door, how are we really going to be able to connect with God in a meaningful way when we feel that presence next to us? But this doesn't mean go live in a bomb shelter. Okay? There's nothing in this world that can save us from what's coming. It's going to get crazy. 
It also means don't go hide in a cabin in the woods somewhere, although that's kind of my dream and I try doing that. That's not God's will. What we need to do is trust that God is fully in control and that if we fully align under him and in him, we don't have to worry about our needs. Those who trust in God will not be ashamed of that crazy time that's coming because in the days of famine, they'll be satisfied. Claiming Bible promises like this is, is going to be the thing that gives us the strength, right? We need to claim these Bible promises and how the place of defense, right? God will provide our, our water and our bread, but only if we're connected to him. And so again, we're not to hide, be a light hidden under a, a basket, right? We read that in Matthew 5, 15. We're, we're not to be hidden away in a bomb shelter somewhere in a remote cabin. We need and we are called to be a light unto the world. We are to demonstrate the character of Christ through the, through the world. Right? Christ's object lessons, maybe my favorite quote ever, the Spirit of Prophecy says, when the fruit forth, the character of God is brought forth, immediately Christ will claim us. Okay? When the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim us as his own. Immediately, God is waiting on us. We need to have the character that prepares us to stand. The only way we can get this is through a revival, right? We need to be praying for a revival. Our first priority should be waking up. Our first priority should be um, you know, figuring out what we need in order to come back to Christ. Our Heavenly Father is more than willing to give His Holy Spirit to them that ask Him, but we need ultimately what? We need confession, we need humiliation, we need repentance, and we need earnest and fervent prayer. And, and these don't happen while we got one foot in, one foot out. This only happens if we're all in. And we say, okay, you know what? My diet, um, God, I choose you over meat. I choose you over, you know, sugar. I choose you over coffee, okay? God, I choose you over, um, you know, hanging out in restaurants all day with my friends or going to the movies or whatever it is that, that you're doing that ultimately is stealing time away from God, stealing time away from making confessions, humbling ourselves before God, repenting to both uh, to God as well as to those that we've hurt, starting healing. Let's, 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 let's heal each other. Let's pray early, earnestly, The Holy Spirit is given ultimately for our spiritual growth. The power of the Holy Spirit is the moral image of God and is to be used, essentially, is to be, we are to be used by the Holy Spirit to have a perfected character. We are to be wholly transformed into the likeness of Christ. But again, we don't use the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses us, right? The descent of the Holy Spirit upon the church is looked forward to um, in the future, but it's the privilege of the church to have it now. But we are to pray for it, right? seek for it. We are to believe it. We must have it. And heaven is waiting to give it to us. God wants to give us the Holy Spirit. He wants to breed a revival and ultimately a reformation, right? The revival is just ultimately just waking up, right? It's, it's a, it signifies a renewal of our spiritual life. We start reading again. We start going to church more regularly, right? We are, we are resurrected from a spiritual death. We are awakened. The Reformation is the cleanup. This is a reorganization of our life, right? It's throwing out things that, that, that God doesn't approve of. It's, it's, it's getting rid of the TV. Really, get rid of your TV, okay? There is nothing good on TV, Nothing. There is nothing on TV that will bring you closer to Christ. You say, well, I only have TV so I can get three angel men. No, throw it out. Make drastic changes in your life to be able to really feel the presence of God because it's beautiful. When Christ, when, when he sends his spirit and lives in us, it's the only way to have peace. You don't worry about this craziness and you find out that God really takes care of his own and stuff is just so easy now it's there's always going to be challenges there's always going to be things that are surrendered to self but the point is it's it's not easy in the sense of um, 
it's death to self every day, right? But it's easy in the sense that God takes care of us. We don't have to worry about stuff. He just, he, he sends the ravens to feed us, right? We need the early rain to start the germination of the seeds in us, okay? That means we need to have the early rain now. We're never going to get the latter rain if we don't first have that revival of the early rain. And then the latter rain, the, 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 the outpouring of the latter rain, which results in ultimately a loud cry that we can be used by God, but he can only use us when we get to a state that, that, that we're acceptable to him. And, and, and ultimately, I even, you know, I even take that statement back. It's more nuanced than that, but let's just leave it like this. Okay, we don't need to worry about the latter rain. All we have to do is keep our vessel clean and right side up and prepared for the reception of the heavenly rain. We are a receptacle. All we have to do is make sure that we're opened to God. We're pointing in the right direction, right? We're not a cup that's upside down, right? We're a basin that's pointed in the right direction, looking up, and we've kept it clean because the Holy Spirit can't come into us if we are, you know, doing things to our body, whether it's, you know, nicotine or alcohol or, or even caffeine or sugar in large amounts, anything that's processed, that that's going to make it hard for the Holy Spirit to embody, you know, to live in us. And you may say, well, you know, I need my caffeine or whatever the, whatever the vice is. And that's you going back to and saying, well, God isn't strong enough to get rid of caffeine. Caffeine, by the way, is, it's, 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 it's a drug. It's not good for you. Same as sugar, but whatever. Maybe you don't want to be hearing this. Look, the point is simply, um, we don't have to worry about doing everything on our own. Right? It's really daunting to say, well, it's just, you know, it's so hard to be good. Right? That just means you're not connected because it's, it's yes, it's our human effort, but our human effort, all we need to do is just, is just look to him that's all our job is, is to stay clean and to stay connected. We don't have to do anything else. God will purge away the stuff. There's a, there's a quote I love that is that Christ will finish the work he started in us. Okay, We can have faith of that. That's why I'm not worried about stuff. Look, I'm so imperfect. Okay, But I don't have, I'm not stressed about it because I just say, God, like, you know, show me the next thing you want me to purge away and, and give me the strength to do it. And over time... Little things get chipped away. I'm definitely not who I was five years ago, right? And I hope that, I, I trust, fully trust, not hope, I believe that Christ will have me be a very different person five years from now. Our part is easy if we have our priorities straight. But if we don't have our priorities straight, it's near impossible. Our part of the work is to put ourselves in connection with the divine channel. God is responsible for the rest. So don't feel stressed out about this. God will lead us every step of the way, but we have to make the choice to say, I don't want to be on this deceiver's ground anymore. I don't want the things of this world. I want to be out of this world. God, I want to serve you. I'm going to wake up in the morning first thing. In fact, take a step back. Before I go to sleep, at a decent hour, I'm going to pray to you, God, protect me through the night and help me to wake up with a desire to get to know you better. The first thing I do when I wake up, you know, is I want to then start praying, God, connect me to you. Give me protection from the deceiver. Right? Send your Holy Spirit to, to, to live in me. You know, drink some water. You know, start preparing your body, right? Preparing your mind. And then read you know, connect with God, spend time with him and, and hear what he has to say to you. And pray again, this time for others and, and for anything that, that popped up through the, the way and, and pray for productivity, help him to have, you know, closed doors, keep you from distractions, keep you from all of the craziness that's in the world. And he will believe that. Our job, again, is just to connect. We are to be that vessel. And so my prayer for each one of us right now is, God, let the latter rain come into my vessel. Let the, the light of the glorious angel, which unites with the third angel, shine upon me and give me a part in your work. Let me be, let me essentially sound the proclamation. I want to be part of the loud cry. Let me be a co-laborer with Christ and trust. 
Lord, I trust you. Help me on the right path. Remove me from the, all the cares of this world. Change me to be like your character. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.